Thank you, everyone, for joining me for these live internet studies. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. The live studies are an hour and a half long. There are two segments. The first segment is Eschatology, a Biblical Study of End Time Events, where we are looking at topics related to end times. We're currently on topic 10, Rapture Views and Overview, and we are going to finish up this section tonight so that next week we are ready to turn to topic 11 making a case for the pre-wrath view the second segment of the hour and a half long study is dedicated to a topic entitled a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism it is an apologetic section where we have been working our way through verses in the bible that are traditionally seen through the lens of a trinitarian perspective but are being challenged by the biblical unitarian perspective and we are taking a look at those particular passages currently we've been parked out in isaiah 9 verse 6. so if you're interested in both topics stick around for the entire study without further ado let's jump into eschatology as you can see on your screen topic 10 rapture views and overview i started this subject this topic way back with a look at the four views that I'm using as the primary, uh, central, main um, views of rapture. There truly are probably about six if I were to expand it, um, but I'm only using four. And so I w decided I would come full circle and read the short little overview language that I read at the very beginning, and then I'll turn to the blog post that we're going to be looking at. The primary four views, let me just show the flash them to the flash them to you real quick, and then I'll go back and actually read this. The four views, remember I said there's about six that we could talk about if I wanted to get overly technical. But the four that I'm working from, the primary ones, are the pre-tribulational view, so pre-tribulationism, otherwise known as pre-trib. There's the chart of what it looks like. I'll 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 elaborate here in a moment. There's the mid-tribulational view, otherwise just known as mid-trib. And there's the chart that we're going to be discussing momentarily. Then we've got post-tribulationism, which is a very popular view today, otherwise known as post-tribbers. There's the chart. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then the fourth view is called pre-wrath. And there's the chart that accompanies it. And I'll go back and read these for us tonight real quick. This also shows up in the description underneath each video for the eschatology section. These four views are mentioned there. And the reason I say there's only four, those are the primary. If we were to pull in two more views, there's a view known as partial rapturism, where it's a partial rapture. Some Christians are raptured, some aren't. Um, that's another view that we could talk about. And then preterism is a kind of rapture view as well. Preterism is, a, is an end time view that I don't embrace. So if, uh, I've talked about it in the past, but I personally don't include it in rapture views just because most of what preterists believe has already been used up in 70 AD but there is a little bit of a little bit of end time um, prophecy left from their perspective namely second coming establishing of the millennial kingdom things like that so they have a rapture discussion in the um, in 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 the uh, uh, at the table but it's not very well developed so those that would bring the total rapture views to six all right let me read this real quick verbatim I've already discussed this, so it shouldn't need to be elaborated on. I, I entitled this Eschatology of Biblical Study of End Time Events, Rapt Reviews and Overview. So let me just read this for you real quick. Let's start with pre-tribulationism. Um, this view was first known as the secret or any moment rapture. It's a relatively new position which was first taught by the founder of the Catholic Apostolic Church, Edward, Edward Irving, in the late 1820s it was then picked up by plymouth brethren pastor john nelson darby and he first preached it on on preached on it in 1843 it's also known as darbyism sometimes this idea of a secret any moment rapture that takes place prior to any tribulation um, it came to America in the late 1800s and was popularized by c.a schofield when he revised his bible notes in 1917 Pre-tribulationists, let me continue, pre-tribbers teach that the return of Messiah has been imminent since the days of the early church and that the church will be raptured sometime before the 70th week begins. That's where it gets its name, pre-trib. Although they have no scripture that in so many words teaches it, 
they teach that there are no signs and the rapture could take place at any moment. They do have verses that they rally around, such as Yeshua's uh, verses in Matthew, where he talks about, um, I come as, behold, I'm coming like a thief in the night. No one knows the day or the hour. Those types of details lend to what pre-tribbers refer to as a secret, no sign, uh, secret signless rapture. I continue, the 70th week of Daniel is therefore considered to be a seven-year period of God's judgmental tribulation, hence the term pre-tribulation. The uh, This position generally views the 70th week as the day of the Lord's wrath, from which the church is excluded. So when we look at the chart, again, rapture uh, is at the very beginning of the seven-year slice. The entire seven-year slice is tribulation slash God's wrath. Christians are exempt from that. Second coming is at the far right of the chart. That's the basic uh, components of this view. Mid-tribulationism, let's talk about that one now. Sorry, let's go like that. This view emerged in 1941 with the publication of the book, The End, Rethinking the Revelation by Norman B. Harrison. They believe that the rapture of the church will occur at the midpoint of the seventh week of Daniel. They see the second half of the seventh week as the wrath of God, and as a result, the church will not be here when God pours out his wrath on the earth. So the mid the uh, mid tribulationism rapture or the mid tribbers, their theology is somewhat similar to the pre tribbers that we just read, other than the fact that they locate the tribulation in the uh, the rapture in the middle of the tribulation, meaning the church by some counts goes through the tribulation if you simply call the tribulation um, the hard times that befall planet Earth. Other mid tribbers would say that the day of the Lord happens at the, after the midpoint rather than the full seven years, let me just show you the chart, that's easier to follow along, that the um, Great Tribulation is equal to God's wrath, and therefore we as Christians are still exempt from Tribulation or Great Tribulation, just like the pre-tribbers teach. And therefore, um, halfway through the seven years is when the Tribulation happens. Meaning, as long as we know when the seven years happens, then the Tribulation can be timed to an event meaning the midpoint. And so thus the mid-tribbers have no problem saying that the rapture is not signless or, or um, Jesus' words, no one knows the day or the hour, um, don't have their normative meaning of we don't know when we're gonna when to expect you. Mid-tribbers obviously say Jesus meant you can expect me right at the middle of the week, right in the middle of the seven years. Second coming is at the far right, just like the other chart shows. In fact, all the charts have second coming at the far right, so that doesn't change. The only thing that moves is the timing of the tribula- of the uh, rapture and the um, scope of the tribulation, how long it is, um, what it actually entails, things like that. But the basic assumption that we're talking about a seven-year period of history is picked up by all four of these views, and it's drawn from Daniel 9.27, where um, Daniel was told that the uh, that there will be 70 weeks, of which the last seven is a future event that everyone's still waiting for. So, let's keep going. Post-tribulationism. Let's talk about that for a moment. Post-tribulation. There are a number of views in the post-tribulation camp. Just like the mid-tribbers earlier, they're not an agreed-upon um, perspective on what exactly the time frame is that we're talking about. The pre-tribbers have the most, what I would consider to be most organized and systematic theology when it comes to their position. Um, it's been the most developed. It's no wonder that it's the most popular view in Protestant circles and among Protestant pastors and seminarians, and that all of the major theolo- theology, uh, theological schools like Dallas Theological Seminary, Moody um, uh, Theological Seminary, um, uh, Fuller, I think, uh, all of them have a pre-trib um, perspective and so it makes sense that this is the one that the, that is the most developed. Mid-tribber, post-tribber, and even pre-wrath are a little underdeveloped just because they are uh, somewhat minority. So post-trib, this is a very popular view, by the way. Don't don't underestimate it. There are some very um, vocal uh, um, adherence to this particular view. Like I think I'll flash this in post-production. But there we have Joel, I think it's reading from left to right in the way that you're going to see it in post-production. If you're watching the YouTube video right now, you're probably already seeing it. We've got Dr. Michael Brown on the far left, 
well-known apologist, a Messianic Jewish apologist. Next to him, we've got Professor Craig Keener, um, who's also a well-known um, Bible exegete and professor of the Bible. Um, these are no these are no lightweights that I'm that I'm flashing on the screen. So Dr. Brown, then Professor Keener, Craig Keener. Then we've got in the middle. I think there's uh, Joel Richardson, who is prominent in Messianic and eschatology circles. Then next to him, I believe, going from left to right, is Dr. Douglas Moo. Um, yeah, Dr. Douglas Moo, I believe. And then next to him should be Pastor John Piper. I believe those are the five that show up in post-production, if, if I remember from uh, some time back. But all of these gentlemen hold to the post-trib view. So what does the post-trib teach? There are a number of views in the post-trib camp. Some post-tribulationists see the church in tribulation since its beginnings and do not view the seven-year period as futuristic. The most prevalent view today is that the seven-year period is yet in the future and that although the church will experience this time of tribulation, it will be sheltered by God's protection before the second coming. For this reason, let me interject, post-trib, because it talks about God sheltering the people in place, in protecting them, and because of its similarity to what God did to ancient Israel during the times of the Exodus with the plagues, many um, Messianic congregations also face or favor the post-trib position, not just because of, of the sheltering in place, and not just because of its um, uh, what its its view that is runs counter to dispensationalism. In other words, there are two phrases that I've been purposely kind of avoiding for a long time, but I may as well mention them now. When we talk about premillennial perspectives, meaning the return of Jesus is prior to the millennium, then there are two large schools of premillennial premillennialism. One of them is known as um, historic premillennialism. This would um, include the post-tribulation -tribula view right now. And um, thus, they locate wrath and rapture, as we're going to find out, on the same day. And what earmarks them or makes them different from the other one that I'm going to mention is that um, a lot of the language that they read about when it comes to uh, Day of the Lord is heavily includes Israel and the church and for God to protect his people before he comes back, before Yeshua returns, God's going to have to allow his people to go through some suffering, but he doesn't have to pour out his wrath on his people. He either protects them in the midst of wrath, or wrath is simply 24 hours long that the people of God are exempt from. But either way, that's historic premillennialism. By comparison, there is dispensational premillennialism, of which pre-tribulation uh, proponents hold to, the one I just mentioned earlier, the one that's the most popular. And their dispensational view forces them to make a sharp distinction between the church and national Israel, and so that rapture is for the church and the second coming is for Israel. And wrath of God is poured out not on the church, God doesn't need to shelter his people through or from the wrath. Rather, um, uh, God simply removes them prior to anything being poured out. That's um, uh, pre, uh, dispensational premillennialism. All right, so back to post-tribbers. Um, the Blessed Hope and... Uh, let me see. George Ladd in his book, The Blessed Hope, and Robert Gundry in his book, The Church and the Tribulation, both teach that the church will experience the seven-year period, which will conclude with the rapture of the church. What does this look like on a chart? Post-trib, where we've got the same seven-year slice of... Daniel's seventh week in view. God's wrath, according to this version, is the full seven years, although other charts will put God's wrath and shrink it down to a mere 24 hours so that the day of the Lord, also known as God's wrath, is reduced to a literal 24-hour day. But this chart doesn't show it that way. But what it does have is that rapture and second coming are both back-to-back. -to -back. We quickly go up, then we quickly do a U-turn, then we quickly come back down. Um, or something to that effect. Tribulation and Great Tribulation still show up in the seven years, separated by that three and a half years um, and three and a half year mark in the middle. All right, and then the last view, this is actually the view that I hold to, and it's the view that we're going to turn to 
in um, topic number 11. This is the pre-wrath view. It's a relatively new position. Yeah, that's true. It's a Johnny-come-lately. I'll admit that. At least in terms of nomenclature, the term pre-wrath and its development and articulation is fairly new. But this doesn't mean that the theology is new. So... Um, the pre-wrath position teaches that the true church will be raptured when the great tribulation by Antichrist, inspired by Satan, is cut short by God's day of the Lord wrath, which will occur between the sixth and seventh, seventh seals of Revelation, sometime during the seventh, second half of the 70th week. The persecution associated with the great tribulation of Antichrist is viewed as the wrath of Satan, whereas the events that follow beginning with the seventh seal are considered the wrath of God. And that last sentence, the differentiation between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God, is a cornerstone earmark of this particular position. So when we see what this looks like on the chart, we have the same seven-year slice of history that we've been looking at all along. It is cut in half by the um, midpoint, right, separating what is not called tribulation on the front three and a half years. Instead, it's relabeled beginning of sorrows. Um, other biblical labels would include um, birth pangs, beginning of birth pangs. So instead of beginning of sorrows, we could say the initial birth pangs. Uh, again, these are, this is language borrowed from Matthew 24. Um, what also separates this view from many of the other views is that the Great Tribulation has shrunk in size to a fraction of what it was in the other views. The Great Tribulation kicks off after the midpoint, but is interrupted or cut short. The Greek word literally refers to amputated. is cut short by the pre-wrath rapture itself and the initiation of God's wrath, otherwise known as the Day of the Lord. So the name is drawn from the fact that the rapture is pre, prior to the wrath of God, but not prior to the tribulation. So what this means is that according to this view, Christians endure the great tribulation. In fact, endure is a really poor choice of words. Christians lose their life. At the, so we will face Antichrist. Many of us will be killed. But some will make it. Paul says that in 1 Thessalonians, as well as 1 Corinthians, that we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So there will be survivors that make it through the Great Tribulation. Antichrist won't be able to kill all of us. But it is the wrath of of God that cuts short the Great Tribulation. It amputates it. It stops it. And therefore, the rapture is that initiating event. Second coming is on the far right, just like all the other charts. And so that's the pre-wrath rapture. So let's, um, let me see, do I want to read those two? Yeah, I think I, I do want to read that. Uh, there's another term that's sometimes expressed, historical premillennialism, which I mentioned earlier, which refers back to the teaching of the early church fathers before 325 AD. They believed that the church would face the persecution of Antichrist and Christ would then reign for 1,000 years upon the earth. So this is part of what separates historical premillennialism from dispensational premillennialism. I think I've got a chart that I'll flash in post-production to show that dispensational premillennialism doesn't need, I'm sorry, historic premillennial, premillennialism, that's a tongue twister, by the way, uh, historic premill, that's easier to say, doesn't need to create a rapture event that removes the church from any tribulation, because according to historic premill, which goes all the way back to the church fathers, like I'm mentioning here, Historic premill is fine with locating the church inside of a rapture and facing the Antichrist because we don't fear Antichrist. We know that Antichrist is just that. He's the opposite of Christ. He opposes Christ. He's the false Christ. He is not the one that we're looking for, and therefore we're not going to put our hope and trust in him. And no matter if he imposes the mark of the beast, no matter if he declares himself to be God, no matter if he declares that everyone in the world worship him and worship his image, we'll not bow down if we're genuinely um, placing our faith in Jesus. So the historic pre-milled early um, church fathers taught their um, followers that they would face the Antichrist. And so this is one of the things that makes it different from dispensational pre-mill. Dispensational pre-mill has to, remember Darby, think Darbyism, uh, 1800s, uh, pre-trippers. Um, they have to create a 
an event that removes the church from any uh, tribulation, and thus pre-tribulation gains its um, popularity from that particular perspective. So, historic pre-mill, they believe that the church would face the persecution of Antichrist. Christ would then reign for a thousand years on earth, with the exception of of two of the ancient fathers, Origen and Clement of Alexandria, uh, who were allegorists. They all taught this view. So, when we talk about the pre-wrath being new, and I believe it's just new in name, it's rooted in historical premillennial perspectives in that it puts the church back in the path of um, persecution and suffering. And why not? The church has always suffered. I mean, would it be any different when before Christ comes, suddenly the church is exempt from suffering? Well, that doesn't seem to carry much biblical weight. But, I mean, the early first church was um, rooted on what happened in 70 AD and the 130s. And what happened then? Was it a rapture event that removed them from all that suffering, destruction of the temple, and the plowing under of Jerusalem? No, no rapture removed them from those events. The early first disciples, the followers of Yeshua, the twelve, they lost their lives. They weren't raptured away. They suffered. They died. They they but they held their ground. Right? They suffered for their faith in Yeshua. And so they understood our Lord's words in Matthew to be speaking to them that they would suffer. Paul told his churches over and over again, you guys are going to suffer for your faith. Just dig your heels in. Put your faith in Messiah. Don't give up. Don't give in. Right? Uh, Rome persecuted the early church. So the letters that were circulating in the New Testament that became what we know now known as the New Testament are chock full of you guys are going to suffer for your faith. So it made sense that the first century church who followed after the early disciples took the view that there's going to be suffering. Pre-wrath, as I keep mentioning, is plainly and simply an expansion of this view, which was which was biblical then, and it's been proven to be biblical still. So um, there's no reason to to invent a an event that's going to somehow uh, excuse us from suffering. I mean, oh well. Uh, Sorry, as we're going to quickly find out, the pre-wrath rapture view is not for the faint of heart who feel that the church shouldn't go through any tribulation. The Bible actually teaches in numerous references quite the opposite. That's why I went on that little rant there for a moment. Indeed, many believers are truly hoping to be raptured out prior to anything bad happening. I'm one of them. I mean, I'll be honest with you. If I had to choose, hey, Ariel, do you want to go through the suffering or do you want to be raptured out? Hello, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, let's take us away, Lord. Yeah, remove us from this. I would hope to be wrong. But I think the important lessons that we need to be prepared to be to to go through it, and so we need to get our spiritual house in order, and um, have a mindset that says, "Lord, if it's your will, remove it. Take this cup from this cup of suffering." Right, borrowing Yeshua's words in the garden. If it's your will, then I don't want to go through this. I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to go through this suffering. But nevertheless, what did Yeshua say? Not my will, but thine be done, speaking to the Father. So we need to say, be saying the same thing. Lord, we hope that pre-tribbers are right, that we're not going to go through any of this mess. But Lord, not our will, not what we want. Let what you want be done. Let your will be done. Well, I'm afraid for many Christians that this would mean a feat first raptures. They're still holding on to the world's affections. For the rest of us, this still poses a problem to our hearts and that we must continually re-examine our priorities in the light of all truth, testing ourselves, right? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and testing our theologies, Acts 17, 11. And then there's some additional charts that I don't need to look at right now. So, let's turn now in these last 40 minutes to this blog from Sola Group, entitled Questions for a Pre-Tribulationist. What we're going to do in this final final topic of topic number 10, remember, let me show you the topic list one more time. We are currently in topic 10, Rapture Reviews and Overview, but we will finish tonight. Make no mistake, I promise you, I'm not going to carry this over to another week. We're ready now to, because we're chomping at the bit, right? We're ready to jump into topic 11 next week, making a case for the pre-wrath view. But what we will do is, since I just mentioned all four views, and since pre-trib is the most popular view, I will show you this chart. Let me scroll all the way to the bottom. Oh, guess what? I did have that chart. I don't need to flash this in post. Here we go. Two eschatological schemes. The first one on the top is called the non-dispensational, otherwise known as historic premillennialism, the one I was mentioning earlier. And in this eschatological scheme, the major events are simply first coming when Yeshua came 2,000 years ago, 
Then we've got that red cross representing the church age that we're currently in, this age. And then we've got this giant arrow pointing down saying second coming. And then after that, we've got a label known as the age to come. So that's the essential non-dispensational historic premillennial perspective that doesn't need to have an event that is um, separate from the second coming. Meaning there's one first coming and there's one second coming in the view known as non-dispensational, otherwise known by its more familiar name, historic premillennialism. That's the top chart that you're seeing in this graphic at the moment. Compare that to the bottom chart. We still have the first coming on the left. We still have the red cross representing the church age or this age. But then suddenly we have an arrow pointing down called rapture. Then we have a label of time known as tribulation. That's the seven-year tribulation according to the pre-tribulational view. And then we have another yellow arrow called return. And then on the far right, we have millennial. And this label is, this entire scheme is labeled dispensational or dispensational premillennialism is the label that shows up in seminaries. So these are the two views. As you can probably opine, the bottom view is the pre-trib view, and the top view are the other views, such as I think mid-tribbers might be non-dispensational. They might they might be uh, dispensational. I need to go back and check that. Suddenly, I'm drawing a blank. But pre-wrath and post-trib are most definitely non-dispensational according to this particular scheme. So I, I forgot that I had that in there.